thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, open your Bible to chapter 3 of Nehemiah tonight, would you? We won't finish this due to the, the matter of time constraint, possibly. I'll see how the time goes. I don't know how long y'all can enjoy. Y'all got padded pews, padded seats? Oh, sort of not. It's padded, but it's not on the seat. I was going to say, some of you got a whole lot of padding back there. You just, I didn't mean necessarily on the seat. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I am only joking. I am only joking. All right. Nehemiah chapter 3. Now, let me say something interesting. When I went to commentaries, even online, believe it or not, how many did not say a thing hardly about chapter 3? J. Vernon McGee had a few thoughts, and he don't outline nothing. And uh, so I couldn't find a whole lot on chapter 3, and here's why. Because when you come to chapter 3, begin right at verse 1, they just start listing some names of individuals or tribes or families possibly. We're not sure. I think they're probably families, and uh, I'll tell you later why. But, man, when you go all the way down the list, I mean, that's all it is, every verse. And to be honest with you, I can't pronounce most of them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have to work at it. I have to go online and listen to see what in the world is that name, you know. And how many of you have ever been there when you read your Bible, you know? Especially when you get in the book of Chronicles, which I'm in at the present, that will kill you. Because, man, that is a chronology of the history of Israel and, and Judah. And, man, they start giving names after name, and you cannot. You sure can't spell most of them. I thought I did real well tonight on the song, by the way. I just knew I was going to misspell abide. But anyway, but it, I'm going to be kidding. But uh, I, I'm saying that when you come to Nehemiah chapter 3, you can't find a whole lot on it. But here's what God did. You, you just pray over anything. God will show you a couple thoughts. And God gave me five thoughts in this little chapter. Now, I'm not going to mention the names other than one, I think. Because the names really, in a sense, even though God gave them to us, is important. And I think even though none of us here know either what, none of them are mentioned in this chapter, you will know. And as far as I understand from my study today and yesterday, none are re-ever mentioned in Scripture. That's how important they are or not. But they're important enough to make the book. It was important enough for God to put the names and list the names and give them, even though he probably knew, hey, that dumb Bill Johnson ain't going to be able to pronounce most of them. <laughs> but I'm going I'm to list them. You know why he done that? And I, if one, re one reason I know, this is not one of the truths I've got, is that God wants to, to us to each know, even though nobody else may know us, nobody else may ever even be able to know our name or by name, God always takes notice of what we're doing. Amen. Amen. Are you aware of that? That's a good thing, good truth to know. But anyway, let me give you a couple thoughts uh, very, very quickly, if I can. A lady by the name of Bernice Gallego, G-A-L-L-E-G-O, in San Bernardino, California, was strumming through an antique shop. She went into a bin, just a regular bin, looking to see if there were dolls or anything of value that maybe she could put on eBay. She ended up discovering in a little bin, true story, a little bin, a little car, uh, baseball card, actually, but it was a real, real old one, and very somewhat tattered, uh, didn't look as good as a uh, uh, mint condition by no means, but she thought, man, this might be worth something. I have no idea, don't know a thing about baseball, but she knew it was baseball because team, a team was on there. So she bought it for a few dollars, took it home, put it on eBay, copied it, put, pasted it on eBay, the picture exactly what it looks like online, and she charged and said, hey, the bid begins at $9.99. After she got back that evening, she started seeing tens of thousands of dollars being offered. And she thought, wow, I done hit on a gold mine. What in the world is this thing it, it, it all about? Now, I'll tell you this. The reason it was so valuable is, according to what the article says, it was the first absolute baseball card in the history of America that was ever published or printed. And it happened to be an 1869 Cincinnati red, now get this name, Stockings. That sounded like a stinking girls baseball team, amen? <laughs> I think I'd have quit just on the grounds of the stockings word, amen? I wear socks but not stockings, are you with me? But, uh, but man, when you think about it, that woman ended up turning around a few dollars in just a few short days and sold it finally to the highest bidder for $75,000. Let me ask you, that'll sort of make you motivated to go antiquing, won't it? Amen and amen. 
Uh, man, we got one right across here. I'm going to Mar and check it out and see if I can find a baseball card. But what did I say? I'm saying, hey, she didn't even know what she had. She didn't recognize any value really in it other than she knew it was old. And that's how I want to start off the sermon. Because when you come to chapter 3, if you try to find much written on chapter 3, with the exception of a hand, very few, you will think, man, there must not be much to chapter 3. Ah, oh, but there is. I learned something as God taught me about leadership from this chapter. Keep in mind, who is the leader leading them to rebuild the walls? What's his name? We know under God, right? So Nehemiah is the, the cupbearer. He's now a contractor. He's going to learn in a couple chapters over, he's also got to be a commander-in-chief of military because they're going to have to build as they watch and in case they're attacked, ready to do battle because the threats are certainly there with Tobiah and the Symbolic. And so here is the situation. Nehemiah is, is already engineering the work. Last week, in chapter 2, we learned three truths, okay? And we closed out with the final one. And then here's what we learned in chapter 2. Early first part of the chapter, we learned he's enlisting the workers. He rallies the troops around Jerusalem. He said, we're going to have a meeting. He said, here's what you need to be reminded of. The whole city is in uh, distress but there's no gates, there's no walls, and the whole city is in despair. Why did he even need to tell them that? They have been living there for years. In fact, I taught you last, last week, a hundred years this has gone by. The gates were already crumbled a hundred years ago. The walls had already been destroyed a hundred years ago. They had done nothing for any inward security, safety, peace, or a protection for the city until Nehemiah came to town, until God called Nehemiah and said, hey, you need to go rally the troops together. I'm ready to build a city. I need it rebuilt. And that's exactly what you see happening. But why did he need to remind them? Because they got so complacent in their, their spiritual lives. Can I tell you what? That's the problem today in America. We got marriages that get complacent. We got Christians that get complacent. We got people in churches get complacent. They're satisfied with status quo. They're satisfied with where they are. They're satisfied with what they're doing. They're satisfied with what they've accomplished, and thus they don't do anything else. Are you with me? I, I, I really believe this. I think the tragedy today is church. And by the way, let me, let me say this. We need, we need some wall builders again. Amen? By the way, that's the title of the message, some wall builders. On the job, building walls. And man, that's what we need in our churches. That's what we need in the valley. That's what we need in America. Man, in America, we desperately in dire need of some wall builders. Amen? We need the wall builders of marriage again in, in the home and the family. They're disintegrating. I mean, man, I talked to that girl from West Virginia. It wasn't her family, immediate family. It's her cousin's family. And uh, the thing she told me going on in that home blew my mind. It, it, nothing I had heard before. But, it, man, it just should never end up. It should not be that way in any home. No home ought to be a home where mom and daddy pretends to be a Christian, comes to the house of God, but lives like the junkyard dog down at the junkyard all week long in front of their daughter. And now their daughter doesn't want to have anything to do with God. Don't want to have anything to do with church. Plays games while the preacher's preaching. And, and doesn't care about anything about the things of God. And I think she might even be demon-possessed, to be frank and honest with you, after everything was told me today of what she does when you approach her about Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying she just says stop. No, that is some wild stuff. But, and I've seen it only one time in West Virginia, one other place. But it, it does. Don't think demon possession is not healed. By the way, I think there's more demons possessing and oppressing in America today than ever before. You know why? Because I think the power of God is leaving the church in America today. Mm -hmm. A lot of this mega church junk ain't what you think it's cracked up to be. Just because they run thousands don't mean God's in them. Don't mean God and the preachers preaching like you ought to be preaching from the book. Uh, but I will say this, man. Thank God for every preacher that lifts up Jesus. Amen. Amen. And preaches the old-time power and the old-time gospel. But I'm saying, man, the church has become a social club in a lot of places. And that's why people don't like to make switches and change. I talked to a lady just recently, over the last past four weeks probably, called me, asked me some questions about our church and so forth. And she said, man, I need to get to church like that. Basically, it's what she said. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, why, why don't you? Well, I got too many friends when I go to church. Even though that church dead as a doornail. The power of God's not there anymore. I'm not going by what I'm hearing and been told. I'm just simply saying, folks, we need to realize, hey, there's only one reason to attend a church and only one reason to make decisions. 
And that's this thing right here. That's the Spirit of God. Right. Amen. 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 No, other, no other reason. Mm -mm. Yeah. Friendships forget. Hey, I had to leave, and I told her, I said, the hardest decision I've made ever in my ever-loving days, honest, still was, two of them, I've had two hard, hard decisions. Number one was to leave my last pastor. And that took six years of praying. Six long, agonizing years, because I just wasn't positive, wasn't sure, walking away from security and everything else that goes along with the job, especially in that church. And uh, the other one was a long time ago when I was just a little itsy bitsy babe in Christ, as far as I was concerned. And that's when God Almighty, through the Holy Spirit, says, you need to leave Elon Baptist Church where you've been called to preach. There's problems here. The Spirit of God's changed, and the preaching's changed, and everything's changing. The Spirit is not where it used to be. And I knew it wasn't. I knew it before my parents did. And I had to leave the church I was called to preach in, was baptized in after I got saved at work, and plus, my mom and dad were still leadership in that church. And I walked away, and man, you talk about hardship. Every meal was, oh, I can't believe you're leaving. I can't believe, man, why don't, which one will which one? You know, man, I had to be preached to nag, nag by my parents every meal. <laughs> Until finally, a year and a half later, God showed them I was right. And they did hire a stinker. I knew he was a stick of the minute he came in preached. I'm just simply saying, man, we need some wall building again. Amen? Amen. Lives are, are, are crumbling before us. They need lives. They need walls of their lives rebuilt. Well, let's look and see what makes for good leadership. I want to call your attention to several things tonight, and uh, we'll go as far as we can. Will you let me go until 15 after? I'll get 50% of it done. How about that? Uh, I want you to see, Nehemiah takes control of the leadership. And as he is leading these people, even though the scriptures does not give us anything at all in chapter 3 about Nehemiah saying anything, somebody's directing the work. Are you with me? And it doesn't imply anywhere in chapter 3 any of those named are leading the work. There's somebody God chooses not to name in chapter 3 because he's already told who's going to lead the work in chapter 1. He's finished chapter 2 saying, hey, Nehemiah, you're my man. You just lead them. You organize. You motivate them. You stir them up to do what I've called you to do. And these walls are going to come up. I'll help you every step of the way. And we've already seen that when he applied for the king. And the king gave him a, a, a right to leave for months away from serving the king in the palace. And then he even come and take the step further and says, hey, what do you need on your journey? And man, he said, man, I'll tell you what. We can have some timber. I like can have some stone. Like you have the, the, the means to be able to do what God's laid on my heart. Hey, the pagan king, by the way, this is the, the kingdom that destroyed it. And yet now they're going to help rebuild it. That sounds a lot like America. We go in and destroy a country, then we spend billions of dollars to repair it. Isn't it? But that's exactly what you find in Nehemiah. Look, if you would, a couple thoughts very quickly. First thing I call your attention to is I see in his leadership a spirit of cooperation that he builds within the people. You say, where do you find that? If you read these verses, you'll find out that the workers that are mentioned here in everything that they do, God has placed it so that once you read it cautiously, carefully, and repeatedly, there's some phrases you'll catch a hold of, and you'll see, hey, God's saying, hey, if we're going to get God's work business done together, that's the only way it's going to happen, by being together. And through our mutual cooperating one with the other. Everybody understand that? Let me ask, let me ask this crowd a question. Y'all look like a semi-crowd that would know anything about football. But when it comes to football, John, you just be quiet, okay? You're probably, you're probably the wisest of the football. Maybe Kim, I don't know. Did you play football? Not like Daddy. When you were in school? Okay. A little bit. I sort of thought you were all four linemen standing up there on the line. But anyway, good night, you. I thought you were both guards and both tackles. But anyway, I'm only kidding, Tim. But uh, if, if I asked for a vote tonight or, or suggested, who is the most important player on a football team? Just just give me an answer. Quarterback. Quarterback? Quarterback. 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 Uh, anybody else have anything other than a quarterback? <laughs> the center? Yeah, he can foul up. Best quarterback can't get the ball. He won't give it to him. Amen and amen. Or throws it over his head every time. So in a sense, you're in a sense right. The coach? Anybody? Coach is vitally important. That's good. The 
Yeah. Well, it depends on who's got the ball. It's all kinds of things. That, that could be done even by a guard or a tackle if he gets a fumble. But anyway, good answer. Can I tell you what? In a sense, we're all wrong. Every single player is as valuable as the other one. The reason you answer the way you do is because the quarterbacks or the running backs get all the glory. But let me tell you something, friend. The best legs and, and moving quarterback or running back in history could and wouldn't amount to a hill of beans without some good linemen mm -hmm. and some backfield running backs themselves at certain playtime hitting who they have to get pushed out of the way, get knocked on the ground so that he can run the ball. Are you with me? The truth of the matter is there is no more important player on a football team, baseball team, basketball team. I know they're stars. I understand that. But the stars are made to look better because of what the other teammates are doing. You take away the other teammates that don't play with the team, no star will ever prevail. Why? Because God is wanting us to know, as you read these verses, we don't know these men. We don't know these families. But every one of them had a specific job. And when you get later over about chapter 6, you're going to find out these walls got built. How and why? Because those that we don't even know their names other than what's given here. Don't, all, don't know specifically everything they did for the wall or on the wall. We're just told that they worked there. Every one of them worked in cooperation one with the other. It was like taking your hand and putting it in a glove, and those fingers work perfectly with the glove. Glove's useless until the fingers go in there and the hand can move the glove. Are you with me? And that's exactly what you see in the rebuilding of the wall. It takes absolute cooperation together, working together. Uh, together for the accomplishment of God's glory. How can the valley be reached for Christ? How can Connections Baptist Church be on the grow, the go, the glow, and everything else we need to be for the Shannon Valley? By working together, by cooperating. We're going to talk more about that in just a minute and give you a perfect example of how we started in the high school and compared for that first Sunday or two, two actual weeks, we had difficulty there. But now it's smooth as silk. And there's a reason why. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why. Because what we didn't know, we were following the book of Nehemiah. And I'll show you in just a second. But hey, there must be cooperation. Hey, you do realize there's some that don't like to cooperate. Amen? Sometimes there are people that don't like to get along with anybody. Amen. Anybody? Anybody know what I'm talking about? A true story. Abraham Lincoln was walking down Washington, D.C. Street one day. And he had uh, his one of his son, Todd, and his other son on the other side of him. They were walking down the street. And man, when somebody came up and approached them, they saw the boys going at it. I mean, they were swatting at each other. And they were saying, no, man, no, I don't want that. I don't want that. And they were arguing. They were in nothing. There was no unity. And they dear sure won't together. And uh, so somebody asked the president, said, Mr. Lincoln. We can't help but notice your boys are not actually conducting themselves as gentlemen right here on the public street. So what's wrong? He said, I'll tell you what's wrong. The same thing as what's wrong with the whole blessed world. He said, what's that? He said, I got three pieces of candy in my pocket. And both of them want two pieces. That's what the argument's about. And isn't that a lot of like people today? Hey, I met people like that in church. Amen? And uh, so, hey, we need to cooperate. We need to have a spirit of cooperation. Let me show you some things interesting I, I found and why I use the word cooperation. Look beginning in verse 1, and I'm just going to get, I'm just going to dodge down through there, through the verses real quickly. The first thing I call your attention is the workers. Who are these workers? They're named, but they're unknown. Even after we read their name, don't mean anything to us other than God put them in the book. Look beginning. The very first thing he, they do mention is priests were involved. Do you see that? Priests were involved. Look, if, if you would, in verse 8, uh, the Bible says, and the goldsmiths, and then it says the goldsmiths' sons, and then it talks about the apothecaries. That's the druggist, I guess. Isn't that where we get the word? Yes. Uh, sort of a drugstore from? Yeah. And the pharmacy. And so they're involved in the work. Verse 9, look, if you would, the rollers are mentioned participating in doing something for this job and this staff. And then notice the next word, mayor, is also mentioned. That's dignitaries, people uh, in some uh, power. Look at verse 12. It, he just even goes on and says, hey, even the daughters are doing something. Reminds me of our church every Sunday afternoon when we close down and we need to rush to get the walls and get everything out on the, out on the street before 1230. You ladies pitch in and help us. I want to know where you at. 8.30 in the morning. That's what I want to But anyway, but anyway, uh, I'm only joking. I'm only kidding. But I'm simply saying, hey, it's, a, it's an effort and it's a team effort, what we have here. 
Somebody asked me the other day, they said, Boy, I'll tell you what, I actually had somebody tell me that you didn't get much when you got the crowd you got. Now I'm telling you, somebody did tell me that. I shouldn't have told you all that. Should no, I? you shouldn't have. I shouldn't have told you. But can I? I wouldn't. No, I'm not. But I'll tell you what, my fire back at. I'll tell you what. I'd rather have them, anybody you got. Amen. Because every one of them's working since they come into our church. Mm-hmm. And I said, I can validate that. I mean, you ought to see us like bees on a Sunday morning. Coming in that hive and everything just boom, 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 boom. Walls go up and the PA goes up and the audio goes up and the video goes up and all the things that we do to get it ready for the crowd that comes in on Sunday morning. Portable church ain't ain't easy to do. I don't want anybody to know that. But you know what? We got it down where it's pretty easy for us. Good night after we work about 30, 45 minutes, most of us sit back and drink the lemonade. Amen and amen. <laughs> but I'm simply saying, without cooperation, it could not possibly be done. Look, if you would, continue, man. We aren't done. Verse 12, the daughters. Verse 22, it said, plain people. I thought, what in the world? Plain people. I thought, well, maybe he's talking about the plains. And then I thought, well, maybe the word means just a plain pe- person. And I think that's really what it means. I got to think, hey, how can I illustrate that for our church? How can I illustrate that Bible study tonight? How many of you know Tom Kennedy? He's about as homely and a plain some person as you will ever see. Amen. I, you do know I'm kidding, Tom. He's, he's not even here to defend himself. He's tall enough to be playing. <laughs> Shame on you. But anyway, plain people. I don't know what it means, but hey, they're mentioned. They're participating in the walls and the work. And then look, if you would, and even verse 29 closes with gatekeepers. By the way, if you went all the way through the entire chapter, circle as I did, everyone, you would find that there are 15 individual occupations given to us, or individual types of people that are all participating. Why? Because they're cooperating. Now, let me ask everybody here a question. Don't you think every one of them had some differences about them? Couldn't some of these people have clashed a little bit? Hey, can I tell you, the the greatest loss I've suffered in churches, in church work, as a pastor, is families leaving my church, not because of me. I, I, I I ran my own number away, I'm sure. But multitudes of times it's been been because a personality clashes with somebody in the church. They just didn't like it. They didn't like the way he walked, the way he talked, they didn't like the way he worked with other people. And they said, this guy, I'm not working with him, I'm leaving. And they've done, they've done just that. I'm just simply saying, hey, we need to realize that, man, we need to cooperate together in this thing of trying to, to win people to Christ. So there's the workers mentioned, but let me ask you a question. Does everybody in church work? No. no. I think they do. I think there's working. There's some working for God, and there's some in churches working against God. Oh, well, yeah. But when you're not doing anything for him, what in the world are you doing positively for him? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but do you think everybody's working in this crew that's given in chapter? I didn't, I didn't see this before. I preached on Nehemiah before. These are new messages, though, I'm preparing. But... I never saw this in my first time I studied because I'm using the same Bible I I did over the years ago. I want you to see something interesting. Drop down to verse 5 and see what it says in verse 5. And next unto them, them, the the, the Kohites uh, repaired. But look at them that last statement. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. There's always not only workers in a crowd, you're going to have a lot more shirkers than workers. Did you hear me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. People that I don't care if you put a, if you, about the most activity you get out of them, if you stuck a piece of dynamite on it and blew it up, that's the most activity that person's going to have in a church in their lifetime. Because they just don't get with the flow. They just don't get with the program. They just have no heartbeat for the things of God. I've never understood that. I'm serious. Because I'm not bragging, I'm not boasting, but when God saved me, God put something inside me that I don't see in a lot of new converts even today. A desire to get in the Bible and study the book. A desire to pray and walk with God. And I'm not judging everybody. I'm going according to what I hear of the pastors telling me what's coming through their church doors today. And they, they, they come and they have the attitude, you've heard me say this, their attitude is not what can I, what can I do now for God? What can I do for Jesus Christ? What souls can I lead to Christ? What kind of witness can I be? What kind of worker can I be for God? There are other options today, and the majority of the women say, what can God and the church do for me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
That's mm -hmm. the brand new mentality by the droves in churches today. Right. They're not interested in what they can do for God. What can the church give to me? Mm -hmm. What can the church possibly bring into my life that I, I need, that I'm void of? Does that make sense? Are you with me? Anybody ever meet some of those people? As a pastor, I've met plenty of them, visiting in homes and, and so forth. They just have a different attitude about church and about the things of God. So they were shirkers, and they were the noblemen's. And then look, if you would, uh, at the second thing. Look at verse, verse. actually, let's just look at verse 4. I'll look, get you to drop down and look at some things. I want you to, I want you to know 28 times, and you've got to consider this chapter is only one. How many verses? Uh, I didn't count the verses of chapter 3. Chapter 3 is 32 verses. 32 out of 32 verses, 28 times, this is repeated over and over and over again. It's not always the same, but let me read you the phrase. The first time it's mentioned in, in verse 4. Look at verse 4. And next unto them repaired Mermoth, uh, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz. Uh, next unto them repaired Meshulam, uh, the son of, I don't know, the son of whoever. Don't care. <laughs> but I want you to circle something. But next to them, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them. And I kept reading next to them. And sometimes it's like next unto him or them. All right, it changes a little bit, but not much. But it always says next to, next to, next to. What is God trying to say here? I think here's what he's trying to say. He said, hey, every leader knows how important it is not only to get cooperation, but also they need to realize how important it is that they have coordination. That they're working together, but they're working in Strategically different places. Does that make sense? So he is co Nehemiah has already coordinated the work. He's engineering the work behind the scenes. Not even mentioned in this chapter. Oh, God simply said, hey, they said, let's rise up and build Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, hey, I'm going to pray that the God prospers us at the close of the end of chapter 2. And in chapter 3, you're introduced to a bunch of workers. They're already on the wall. They're already starting on the gates. And it just gives you some names of some individual families, individuals that are working. But they're working next to each other. you got this worker here. And next to them is this one. Next to this one. This one. And I think what Nehemiah did is, you know what? I think it'd be good to put this one right here. Let's get these next to this one. Let's put this one next to this one. I'm going to show you why I say that in just the next point. He was just simply leading the, the workers so that they learn something about coordinating and working together. 28 times. By the way, whenever uh, our troops go into battle, when we did the invasion in Iraq, or any war we've ever fought, long before we do the invasion, there are generals, many of them, meeting uh, in Washington, D.C., long before the invasion, long before anybody even knows it's coming. And they have pre-planned, they have pre-thought, they have so organized so much to the degree that it is perfection in its coordination. Because, hey, we sometimes think an invasion just means we've got to send troops. Oh, no, no, no. There are dozens of things got to be done. You've got to have bridge builders, not just all people with banging guns and shooting and, and, and going in to fight the battle. That's only part of the war. You've got to have bridge builders. You've got to have road builders. You've got to have uh, 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 su uh, supply trucks and truck drivers to bring in the supplies because as they advance, they've got to have the means to feed them, clothe them, ammunition, on and on and go. It's a big deal. Now, the wall of Jerusalem is now being built, and the times are a lot different. They don't have the means to move things quite like we do. But you can bank on this. Nehemiah's got the plan already working out. And by this chapter telling us they were next to each other and they were doing this part of the work, this part of the work, they were working here, working there, he had already coordinated everything by the help of God. Are you with me? And a good leader knows how to coordinate things, gets things together so that they move in advance. Look, if you would, at verse 10, verse 23. I'm just giving you the verses 23, 29, 30, and 20, uh, verse 28. It says something different. They were working over against his what? Did anybody see it? House. House. Have you ever wondered why in the world it was? It was just saying they were next to each other, next, 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 next. But now all of a sudden, changes. He said he put some over near where? Their own houses. Anybody guess why? Because when you're building the wall to protect your family, to give safety to your own kin, you're going to doubly right. dog. Be sure you do it right. You build it strong, and you don't cut any short, short cuts. Amen? I'll get it out in a minute. Are you with me? Does it make sense? 
And that's exactly what they're doing. And so, man, can't you see the coordination involved here? In Let me give you this. Hey, I think thirdly, this chapter teaches us as, because everybody's working perfectly, even though they all got different backgrounds, educational backgrounds, financial backgrounds, personality backgrounds, abilities, and even gifts. And yet it's like a perfect puzzle being assembled together for the work of God. That's the cooperation. That's the coordination. But then to get it all to be accomplished, it requires great communication. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah. Can I tell you what's, what's wrong with so many places? We don't communicate well. We sometimes have problems communicating. I heard about a husband and wife that were at a, uh, a gathering, and another man came up and said, Hey, man, my wife and I have some marital problems. We're going to marriage counseling. You haven't been to marriage counseling? He said, No. He said, What are you going for? He said, Man, I'm going because we're not communicating according to my wife very much. He said, Oh, my wife and I got that nipped in the bud. We communicate great. So what makes your, your marriage different? He said, Well, number one, my wife has a doctorate degree from colleges in communication skills, a communicator. And she communicates with me all the time. So well, what, 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 how do you respond? He said, well, I went and I got my degree in acting school. And so whenever she speaks to me and tries to communicate to me, I just act like I'm listening. Amen and amen. Hey, the real problem in a lot of situations in the hour that we live today is that we have horrible communication. Sometimes even internally within churches. I've had people I, over the years of being a pastor at churches call me. I've had lay people from other people's churches. Now, I don't talk about other pastor churches, but ask me questions. And they'll ask me something about, some, about finances. You know, how do you do your finances? And this is how. And, and sometimes I don't want to get pulled into that kind of a thing. But, you know, sometimes they're just simply saying, hey, they're not communicating with us. We don't understand what's going on here. We don't know nothing. Are you with me? That's poor leadership. Because a good leader will always communicate and know well how to communicate with his people. Because, man, when there's no communi when the communication lines are breaking down, anybody know also, before long before Iraq is, is going to be invaded, the first thing on the ground they get set up thoroughly, thoroughly, is communication lines. They know everything communicationally before they know anything, even sometimes militarily, with the troops being launched. Because they want to know once those... Feet hit the ground, running. They want to be guaranteed they can communicate easily, quickly, readily. So if something goes wrong, man, they can resolve it as quickly as they can. And you can't know anything in a battle unless you can communicate. Isn't that right? Amen. Can I tell you why sometimes divorces take place in marriages? Communication lines break down completely. They just quit talking. Or instead of discussing and talking and listening, they talk at each other. Now, that's not talking. Talking with each other is what God wants you to do. That's where one's listening, the other one's talking. Or vice versa. But when you start talking at one another, that's not discussion. That's not talk. That's just you running your mouth. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> being bold and bluff, but I'm being honest. Uh, and probably if it's a husband you're talking to, he probably ain't listening anyway. Amen. So you might as well save your energy. John, listen to this down here, man. You got three chiming in. They must all know the husband. <laughs> but anyway, hey, communication. Let me give you. Hey, I'm going to finish this. If you let me go to 15, I think maybe. Hey, then there's a leadership which I call concentration. When you read these chapters, again, he concentrates the workers perfectly lined up where they need to be. He's already pre-calculated. Then he puts them exactly near their house, some of them, because he said, hey, if anybody's going to knock it out quickly and safely and not going to cut corners, man, the ones working closest to their house will stay focused on the job. Concentration just simply means get the people focused. Amen. Now, you got to keep in mind, who, who is being attacked during these chapters? And you're going to continue to see it under attack in chapter 4, in chapter 5, all the way up to chapter 6. The, the, the workers are being attacked, but the main one is the leader. Amen. Nehemiah is constantly being barraged by Tobiah and Sambalat. And man, they're constantly making fun, mocking. They even cause the internal strike. And then before long, we're going to see internally in the workers, there's discord. There's division. There's some communicating with the Arabians on the outside, which is nothing more than Arabs. And uh, they're communicating with uh, Gisham and uh, Tobiah and Sambalit. And man, that's always a no-no. 
with the enemy. Amen? Amen. And that's exactly what ended up transpiring and changing. So they, they focus on their concentration, and Nehemiah gets them concentrated. Let me go, let me go back to what I said. John remembers this. J.R. remembers this. Grady remembers this. Paul remembers this. Uh, Tim wasn't with us at that time, and some were not here. Tom was with us. Uh, I'll mention those that were here. When we first moved into the, the high school auditorium, um, and the very first Sunday, we, we knew we, we were starting service at 1030. We're going in at 9. That gives us an hour and a half. First two services were late the first two weeks because we just weren't getting it. And, and I, I, I tell you what, uh, the walls are going, it looked good once it's done, but man, one service was quarter to 11 when we started the service. 15 minutes late. Can't be doing that. And people are there seated and watching, and man, things are still, everybody's still running around like ants with their heads cut off, you know, whatever. And, uh, and that's exactly what it looked like. First two weeks. Paul, you remember some of that. And uh, then eventually, and I had a job. I was, I was just in charge of the nursery starting off. And then I in fact, eventually moved into the auditorium, started helping them with the, the walls because that was sort of lagging a little bit. So Tom, me, Warren Cash, and uh, one of the boys of, of Mark Sprouts, whichever one decided to work with John at the time. I don't know which one specifically focuses with you. But anyway, let me tell you, after two weeks, we knew it wasn't working. J.R. and I met, and then all of a sudden, John calls me and contacts me and said, Preacher, I got an idea. Now, when I tell you that I hate to say this, it was a great idea. <laughs> and, and I know where, while you're sitting there, anybody that knows John, I can see the shock on all of your faces. How did he have a great idea? Amen? When you look and know John Cosgo, I mean, nothing through this skull ought to be great. Amen and amen. But it really was. <laughs> and, and he met with me and he said, hey, forget what you and Jay are. I mean, he was trying to be unkind. He said, I've got an idea, and I, I believe this will work. He said, let everybody have one specific thing they focus on. They are only free from that job once that job has been completed. You can do whatever you do in the nursery, stay with the nursery. I ended up changing because I ended up finding Mark Sprouts had, had actually assembled the nursery as quick as I was doing it. I said, Mark, you take this. I'm going in the main auditorium and help them. Now, after we did his plan the first week, we got it done with 30 minutes left over. Can I tell you now, most of the work outside of J.R. tying down, down a couple things, we're out by, we're finished within now 45 minutes, almost consistently. Now, I say that to say this. Everything we've learned from Nehemiah in this chapter tonight, I didn't see it then, didn't even know about it then. But every bit of what he got the people to do in chapter 3 is exactly how we knocked from 10, what, 1045 completion down to now 9.45, cut an entire hour off of our thing. And things look, I think, nicer, better, and, and everything just moving smooth as silk. Why? Because I think we, we didn't know what we were doing. We just got back to what the Bible already said. God already knew how to do it. Maybe I should have read the book of Nehemiah sooner, amen? I've been telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me. I know. Yeah, John Wright. Gotcha, gotcha, man. I understand that. But anyway, I simply say that to say this. Hey, they learn to concentrate and to focus on the one area closest to their house or wherever. Nehemiah said, that's going to be your job. That's your part of the wall to work. And that's exactly how we've done it. That's exactly how we've done it. Let me give you the last thing very quickly. I ain't going to finish it. Look at, I know you've got to leave chapter, uh, chapter 3. Uh, you, you find out all the way down in chapter 4, verse 6. The Bible gives a compliment to those who've been working on the walls and it simply says what? Somebody read, John, read you, you in verse 6 of chapter 4. Uh -huh. read, read verse 6. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, so the people had a mind to work. All right, now, this is being stated by somebody. Yes, it's God's word, so it's God, yes. But I think it's Nehemiah. He's, he's speaking through Nehemiah. But here's the deal. Anybody that leads, and any workers who follow, and it requires a leader can't lead without any workers to follow. And that's got a willingness to follow. All right, you with me? But any leader knows anything about leadership will know how to constantly commend his people for jobs well done. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I have failed miserably in many, many places many times. But I think most of you here tonight can testify. And if Brian was here, I was going to ask him personally because he and I have been working together as PA people for 10 years or more. And uh, I think Brian would testify that I never left the pulpit, never left the Sunday, that I didn't come by when I handed that mic to him. Thank you for what you do to he and Jamie both. Thank you for serving. 
Thank you for what you do. You never get a text from me without me saying thanks or thank you so much or thank you for your service. I've learned a little bit over a long time as a leader of how to commend people because when you commend them, it makes you feel a little bit more important, like, you, like you're doing something. And you are. And all of us are giving, are serving, are witnessing, are, are inviting, are calling, are passing out the, the flyers, 6,500 of them or 7,000 uh, the weeks we were doing that and all of that. Hey, all it takes all of us to do this thing called the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen? And to build God's church and to build God's work. So there's commendation. A good leader knows how to compliment and to commend. We may fail sometimes. And let let's, this happens, and it could happen, even here. As conscientious as I try to be of that. You do something good, something God leads you to do for the church, but I don't take notice about it. Nobody else seems to care that you did it. Nobody else seems to ever come up, pat you on the back, and say, boy, thank you for doing that. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for serving in that capacity. Can I remind everybody here that there's somebody that does know? Amen. There's somebody that is the most important observer, is observing right. what's going on Amen. and what's been done in his name and for his sake. Amen? Amen. Amen. A missionary, true story, a missionary is coming back from Africa. He buried his wife and buried both of his kids. <coughs> been there for many, many years. Cholera and the fever took all three of his family members. He was well beaten. He's now much older in age. But he had been a faithful servant for so many years. He was on board a big vessel coming into the port of New York, the harbor, New York Harbor. And as he entered closer and closer to where he was so supposed to deboard, he noticed, man, there were crowds and scores of people waiting on the, on the, the docks, waving and screaming and yelling. And even then, as he got closer, he heard music playing, and there was even a band there. And he started thinking, wow. I can't believe, how in the world, man, maybe my board told the people what I've gone through and how much I've endured as a missionary and, and how I've tried to be faithful to God at, at a great price. And man, he, that discouragement that he felt, that downtrodden spirit that he had, man, all of a sudden got big lift until he discovered when, he, when they deboarded, it wasn't at all anything for him. He had nobody there. Nobody even from the board to me. No family members. They were buried. Nobody was there. They were there because President Theodore Roosevelt was returning from a safari trip in Africa, shooting animals, lions, and, and uh, elephants. And they were there well wishing to the president. And deboarding, according to the testimony, as it is written by the missionary, he said, I got discouraged like you can't believe. An overwhelming darkness started invading my soul. And I sort of just cried out momentarily to my God. God, I don't understand. Nobody cares. Nobody sees at all that I've come home. And he said all of a sudden, in his spirit, it seemed to be that God spoke to him. He said, son, you got it wrong. You ain't home yet. Amen. And you know what? We're not home yet. Isn't that right? right. And man, we got a work still to do, a work to still complete. And let me close with this. When we think about the spirit of commendation, General Douglas MacArthur, one of my heroes in the military, uh, if you know anything, if you ever read his book and uh, some biographies about Douglas, uh, General Douglas MacArthur, he's a tremendous man. He really was. Tremendous military leader in his day and time. But he literally, they were invading and had a, a real serious invasion trip getting ready to take place. But prior to the invasion, they had to send a little small group in to scout out what and so forth. And it was so serious that Doug McGarland wasn't pulling any punches. So he had a whole company of his, his men stand, a whole company. And they all stand there, and he's giving them and telling them, hey, I need some volunteers. I'm not going to mandate or command any officer or any other soldier because this is serious. You could very well likely be killed doing what I'm going to ask you to do. But it's got to be done. I only need a few good men who will volunteer. They say, as the story is written, that he turned around to his desk to be able to reach at some paperwork and to pick up a map to show them some things. And as he turned around, he had just told the men, if there's any volunteers, take two steps forward out of the company. And when he turned around, there was nobody that stepped up to the plate. Everybody was in perfect line. And he thought, wow. 
I mean, he's thinking to himself, according as he writes it. And then he turned to the men and he got rebuking. He said, I can't believe this. I've asked only for a few men and I know it's serious and I know you may lose your life. But surely somebody would have the courage to step out and say, I'll be the one to go. And his other officer turned to the general and said, sir, you misunderstand. When you turned around, the reason you don't see anybody out in front is because all the whole company stepped two steps. He said, they're all willing to do it. And they're all willing to go. Listen, listen, I close with this. If we have that kind of attitude, and we have that kind of spirit, listen, the gates of hell won't be able to survive our onslaught. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. As we try to do it for God's glory and for Jesus Christ's honor. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's dismiss in prayer. John, dismiss us tonight. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for so great and mercy, Lord. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for how it encourages us and it lifts us up. And, and Lord, it can help us, uh, Lord, every single day, Lord, to stay focused on you. Mm-hmm. As, Lord, you've uh, blessed this church with, uh, Lord, helping the pastor bill started and, and, Lord, adding to it. And, Lord, I just pray, Lord, as we, we've heard about unity and, and what these uh, people had to go through. They had to, to battle and uh, mm-hmm. Lord, to, to, to build it all at the same time. And, and, Lord, their hearts and their minds and their hands were to the work. And, and Lord, I thank you. It applies so much to this church, Lord. We, we just, just keep focused on you. And, and Lord, the high calling that you place upon us, Lord, mm-hmm. to, to help build this and for this community, Lord, to save souls for Christ. Mm-hmm. And, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. It encourages <coughs> us and challenges us. And, and, Lord, thank you for our pastor, Lord, who's been been blessed, uh, Lord, enough to, to be able to start another church, and Father, to, to have a, a group of people that he loves, and, and Lord, we're willing to stay behind him. And Lord, as he's our Nehemiah, we thank you for him, Lord. Amen. We just ask, Lord, that you would bless us each day this week, Lord, as we continue to, uh, to Lord, to push forward for you. Lord, bless the church on Sunday, Lord. Father, as we spoke earlier, Lord, we're looking for a building. Uh, Lord, we want to get planted and uh, have a place where people can call home. Lord, we just lift that to you, Father, and ask you to provide for that. You, you've done so much, and I almost feel I'm ashamed to ask for anymore, but Lord, we know that you know our need, and Lord, that's the heart of the people, Father. We just ask that you would, uh, Lord, bless that. And so, Father, we thank you again for another great service, Lord. We ask that uh, you would bring us all back Sunday, and perhaps bring a visitor, Father, and, and Lord, uh, give us a good day, Father, and help uh, this church to grow at both your pace. Yes. May everything that's said and done bring you honor. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank God y'all finally get to go home. Hey.